Hello, everyone, everybody, and welcome. My name is Adam Rivera, and I work as a conference content programmer for MJ Biz, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today's webinar. First, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Hawthorne Gardening Company, for today's webinar, Converting HPS to LED, Key Considerations. In today's webinar, Dr. Craig Yendrick, Senior Scientist with Hawthorne Gardening, Hai Trong, VP of Sales, and Brandon Robinson, Technical Services Engineer at Hawthorne, will discuss how Hawthorne Gardening Company takes a holistic approach to understanding how the differences in technology affect your entire growing environment and walk you through key adjustments that they've learned through rigorous testing in their R&D facilities and partnerships with elite growers to help make the transition to LED seamless. After the presentation, Craig, Brandon, and Hai will be available to answer questions from the audience, so please use the Q&A box below for questions. Those questions will be addressed by the group after the presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. I have some questions here for you all, so uh, we'll go ahead and dive right into those. So uh, how has Hawthorne gained knowledge of LED implementation? Um, we'll go ahead and we'll start with Craig with this one. Yeah, thanks, Adam. So the short answer is that we're actually running biology trials with our new LED fixtures. Uh, I'm Dr. Craig Gendrick, the lead biologist on the lighting and nutrient teams for Hawthorne. And, and Hawthorne's a unique company because it's one of the few that in the cannabis industry um, that has biological capabilities. Currently, we have a team of over 20 biologists working at one of our four field research stations, and we're testing the entire portfolio of Hawthorne products. You can see a picture here is one of those research stations that's located in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, and it's operated in partnership with the Flower Corporation, a licensed cannabis cultivator in Canada. For over a year now, we've been running R&D trials in Kelowna, and the facility uh, has over 20,000 square feet dedicated to cannabis cultivation research. Um, and the unique part about the Kelowna facility is it's divided into 10 grow rooms. Each one of those grow rooms can be controlled independently. Uh, so it creates a, really a specific research environment um, that we can custom our growing conditions similar to commercial grower. Um, as you can see here, we have rooms dedicated uh, specifically for propagating our own plants. We have grow rooms outfitted with all the um, benching and fertigation uh, infrastructure that allows us to grow as, as any commercial grower would. And so um, what that allows us to do then is to, is to really conduct separate trials all at the same time, but individually focused on uh, lighting or nutrients or growing media. Um, and we also have which is uh, one of the key parameters for our, our success criteria is we have post harvest drying and curing rooms that allows us to measure um, uh, bud yield. And then we also have an onsite analytical lab that allows us to measure all the key aspects of, of plant chemistry. Um, so, so really what this does is gives us the opportunity at our Kelowna facility to do trials with our own products, either commercially available or new experimental products. Uh, while mimicking the like the exact growing conditions in, in indoor growth facilities. So we examine how our nutrients pair with different growing media substrates, how the application rates differ under various grow lights, uh, and how growers can adjust their irrigation patterns to maximize crop performance. So in other words, we can really study the entire connected system. Uh, plus we're not running trials in small reaching grow chambers like a university might do, we're really putting ourselves in the same shoes as, as actual growers. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, on top of that with our R&D team, uh, we also have a full technical services team uh, that's uh, kind of the on the field uh, technical group. Um, it's a team divided up into kind of a mechanical portion and a horticulture portion. Uh, so we have a team of uh, engineers who do lighting layouts, uh, HVAC design, light layout, or sorry, um, airflow layouts, uh, as well as horticulturalists who can help with uh, fertigation, irrigation, uh, different fertilizer mixes, really help growers out if they're having issues um, and kind of support any of the products that we really are putting out there uh, in the market. Um, you know, we uh, in, within Canada, we have the ability to do analytical services. Uh, and then we also have the ability for, uh, like I said, different horticultural services and then different controlled environment services, whether that's be uh, HVAC or, or lighting or uh, airflow irrigation. Um, we really are kind of a 360 degree team. 
you know, uh, controlled environment agriculture is a, a somewhat co of a complex system. Uh, and by having a team that has a background in every one of these categories, we're really able to look at every item within the grow uh, and really help growers maximize uh, whatever they're trying to accomplish. Thanks guys. Hey, let me add this piece also. At Gavita and Sun System, we've been testing LED technology dating back 12, even 13 years ago. Uh, early LED fixtures in the marketplace lacked intensity, proper color spectrum, and reliability. Uh, what they didn't lack was price, right? These things were going for four to five grand. Uh, we started noticing about three or four years ago, LEDs began to match or even surpass the performance and yield of HPS. Um, some of the LEDs out there today actually improve yield and quality all at about 25 to 40% less watts versus HID. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's great that you all approach the needs of a growth facility from so many different angles. Um, so let me, let me move on to question number two here. So uh, Craig, you mentioned the Kelowna facility. Can you tell us more about the type of research that's being conducted there? Yeah, sure. So one of the very first trials that we ran in our Kelowna facility was to compare uh, cannabis growth, bud yield, potency of uh, plants grown with either the Gavita 1000 watt HPS or our new top light LED fixture, the CT1930E. And for the, the goal of this trial was really to, to determine if it'd be possible for a grower to do a one-to-one -one swap when replacing the existing HPS technology with the new, with the new top light. Uh, and, and the goal here was just to do that without any loss in productivity. So, so for the trial, we set up a, a replicated design. We used multiple grow rooms, and that allowed us to perform the necess necessary statistical analysis to make valid scientific conclusions. So to, for that, each room, uh, we hung the fixtures at the same height and distance from each other uh, based on an original lighting design that was optimized for HPS. And also in each room, we grew the same cultivar, we used the same substrate, we used the same uh, continuous nutrient uh, feed program with the same environmental set points uh, for temperature, humidity, CO2 concentration. Uh, in addition, all plants were pruned the same way, all plants were dried and harvested the same way. So uh, really the only key difference uh, in, this, in this trial, this first trial was the type of lighting that was used. All this stuff is very exciting. Um, some of the stuff I'm really looking forward to down the road is, is us digging deeper into customizing growing recipes based on genetics, right? Um, right now, most growers are using similar or slightly modified recipes when it comes to feeding or lighting, environmental, or even CO2. So uh, with Kelowna and other facilities, we expect to uncover some of the best practices that should revolutionize cultivation indoor and outdoor. Awesome. Thanks guys. So uh, next question. So what's being observed in these, in the two rooms here? Yeah, sure. I'll take that. Well, so we knew going in that there was going to be a difference in the amount of infrared radiation that's emitted from these two, two different fixtures. Uh, the HPS spectrum has uh, specific wavelengths in the elect, in the region of electromagnetic spectrum that, that goes past where the 1930 emits. Uh, and that's in the range of between 700 and 850 nanometers. And what that can do is that infrared radiation uh, that's emitted from HPS has a tendency to directly heat the surface of the plant leaves. So part of the trial, what we did was monitored leaf temperatures to see how they might be different. So as I mentioned before, the, these two rooms were set up uh, uh, using identical conditions that, that includes the identical ambient air temperature. And so when we keep that ambient air constant, in this case, we set it to 26.5, uh, which, which we, we optimized for the HPS room. What we actually found was the leaf temperature uh, in, the, in the LED room was, was a, a few degrees lower. And so you can see in this figure, the room is, was divided into three different benches. We've got average temperature uh, measurements that were collected from plants on each of those three benches in the, in the 1930 room also in the HPS room, and you can clearly see there's a, a about a two to three degree temperature difference. And, and that's, that. while it seems like it's a minor difference, it can actually have um, big effects on plant growth. And so the, the 
the key thing that I want to emphasize here is that depending on what your current temperature targets are, if you, when you do change to LED, it could shift the temperatures of your grow operation below what what's optimum for cannabis. So we really recommend new growers as you're making that transition to, to go ahead, uh, make an investment in an infrared uh, thermometer to be able to measure the leaf temperature in your current HPS setup. And then once you install the, the LEDs, uh, you, can, you can make the necessary adjustments to your ambient air temperatures to achieve and match that desired leaf temperature that you were growing with before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, with, you know, with the change from HPS to LED, you know, there's, there's a change of that, that leaf temperature. There's also, you know, there's a huge change to the entire environment. We've complete by changing the lighting technology, we've completely changed the way that heat is entering into the room and how power is kind of being managed. Um, you know, an HID lamp is essentially a, a big tube of gas and we're hitting it with high voltage. It's exciting that gas. It's getting extremely hot up to, you know, six, 700 degrees Celsius. Um, and all of that heat is being kind of captured in that reflector and radiated down directly towards the plant. Um, whereas with an LED, uh, the process is a lot different. You know, an LED chip is three layers of uh, semiconductor material. You apply electricity to it. It generates light and it also generates heat. Um, the difference, though, is instead of that heat being thrown down towards the plant, um, we have to manage the heat very differently because uh, LEDs don't like heat. Um, high uh, heat temperatures on, on LED leads to uh, very rapid degradation. Um, so we need to pull that heat away from the LEDs as fast as possible. Um, and really, that's why we have, you know, you'll see giant you know, heat sinks on the back of LEDs. Um, because we're, you know, quickly pulling that heat away from the plant, or sorry, from the LED, and we're throwing it into the environment behind the LED rather than forward. Um, you know, so this is a kind of picture that, that represents that is, you know, lots of heat coming out the back of the fixture, not as much heat coming out the front end. Um, and it causes a, it causes a large shift. Um, to be honest, you know, thermal management of an LED fixture is really one of the most critical design challenges. You know, you can have an LED, um, an LED fixture uh, extremely cheap. And if they've kind of overlooked the thermal loads uh, of an LED fixture, you know, you could have a fixture that is kind of gone within, you know, a year. Um, this is why with like the CT1930, our, our new top light fixture, uh, we have, you know, a patented heat sink design um, that's really there to make sure that the fixture can deal with all the thermal loads. Because uh, not only is it, uh, you know, dealing with the thermal loads for LEDs is difficult with this type of LED fixture, a top light, it's even more difficult because instead of taking all those LEDs and spreading it over a four by four frame, like, like in some of our other like rail style fixtures, we've taken all of that heat and we've kind of jam packed it into a smaller area. Uh, so managing that heat is is uh, very very critical, uh, but our engineers have done an amazing job uh, dealing with that and actually making this fixture one of the uh, one of the fixtures with the highest ambient temperature rating uh, on the market. Awesome, thanks guys. Super interesting stuff. Uh, I wanted to ask, so what else are you observing? And uh, let's go with Craig on this one. Yeah, so we also uh, monitored uh, PPFD and that's short for photosynthetic photon flux density. Uh, and that's a measure of the light intensity in the region between 400 and 700 nanometers, which is called PAR. Uh, and for these PPFD measurements, uh, you can see the video here showing the, the um, associate in our Kelowna facility taking the measurements at canopy level uh, as the plants were growing. And, and you know, what we did throughout the grow trial was, was monitor those uh, light levels based on selecting you know, just a, a few plants on the bench to get a, a good average um, at the canopy level. And this figure here on this slide shows, you clearly see that on the, on the LED room, the CT1930s are providing a more intense light at the canopy. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that really is, is a key driver for, for plant growth in, in the indoor environment. And, and so what does that mean to a grower? Well, what we, what we saw in these trials is uh, a pretty good 
uh, increase in, in bud yield. And that's, that makes sense based on the scientific literature. There's a really well-known positive correlation between light intensity and crop yield. Um, and, and that's exactly what we saw. Yeah, it was actually our, uh, our internal lighting design team that did the designs for uh, the Kelowna facility. Um, and what was really nice about these rooms was that the HPS layout was done well before the CT1930 had been developed. So when we did the conversion to the CT1930, um, it was very much how we kind of envisioned uh, a lot of growers going through this transition of having already laid out their HPS, you know, our Gavita H, uh, HR96 reflector, switching that fixture out and putting in the CT1930. Um, and as you can see from the graphs I have and, uh, and video here, you know, our PPFD is slightly higher uh, and our uniformity is slightly better. I, I mean, I, I pretty much say it's about the same, but it is on average, it's usually a little bit better. Um, you know, one of the main reasons that uh, Craig's team might have also been noticing uh, a lower PPFD level with the HPS fixtures uh, is, you know, HPS lamps degrade over time. Uh, with those HPS fixtures, they've probably already been running for a certain amount of time, so they've lost some of their total output. Um, you know, it's something that we always like to make sure the growers are aware of, of when they're changing out to an LED fixture. Are we comparing a, a you know, a five-year-old HPS fixture to a brand new LED fixture? There's generally going to be a large increase in your uh, in your total uh, PPFD output. Um, you know, this kind of leads us to our uh, the the optic that we have in our our CT nineteen thirty. Um, you know, the our original fixture of the Gavita double ended thousand watt fixture had our reflector, which is called the HR ninety six. Um, it's a very wide spread optic and it allows great overlap from one fixture to the next so that we can get great uniformity uh, at a variety of different PPFD levels. Um, I can put in a low density of lights to hit maybe 600 PPFD and with high uniformity or achieve high uniformity. The idea with the optic from the CT1930 was to mimic that distribution so that when we make the change, nothing really changes uh, in terms of the light levels and the distribution that you're seeing. A lot of the other kind of like LED top lights that are out there don't normally don't have a secondary optic uh, because normally they, uh, they reduce a lot of the amount of light that comes through. Uh, so they just use kind of like a, a raw LED output, which is what you can see on the right there. Um, you know, doing this when you do a one-to-one -one swap like that can generally lead to a lot of hot spots uh, within a within a grow if, if they're not laid out properly. Um, our optic, though, because it's again another one of the patented items on our fixture, uh, it only loses about two percent of the total light output through the optic, which is something that's pretty much unheard of for uh, optics for for LED fixtures. Um, you know, the, the discussion of, of optics and layouts and things like that, it's, it's something we always make sure we, we push forward is that you always want to get a light plan done for, for your larger grow rooms. There are a lot of different optics and light types out there. Um, trying to follow a kind of rule of thumb plan of a four by four or five by five might not complement the fixture in the way it's supposed to be utilized. And you might not get the plan that you're hoping for. Um, this is kind of an example uh, that I like to put it together. So this is a um, this is a par map. You know, if you've seen a light plan before, you're usually looking from the top down, uh, and you see kind of the the light levels at a at a specific level. This is looking at the light from a horizontal, so a cross section of the room. And as you can see on the top, if we're using you know one of the more kind of like spotlight style of fixtures where you get a very high intensity uh, in one particular area it's really hard to get a uniform distribution of that light across a large canopy, right? We get a lot of kind of spotty light in between uh, each fixture. Whereas with the widespread optics doing a proper layout that's done by uh, you know, a design team, we can get a very uniform distribution of light so that the plants are all seeing basically the same light level. Um, you know, this is why Hawthorne has a wide variety of HID and LED fixtures, because it depends on what the layout of your room is. We can always kind of find the right fixture that'll fit the application for your grow. Awesome. Thank you, guys.
so Craig, you had mentioned that to raise leaf temperatures, we could raise the ambient room temperatures. What kind of effect would that have on the HVAC systems? And would there be a significant savings? Yeah, uh, I can I can take that one. Uh, this is a question we deal with a lot with some of our uh, with some of the growers when they're making the change. Um, there's no doubt that you know making the change from HPS to LED, it's a large reduction of the amount of heat that's going into your room. Um, but it's a common misconception that you know LEDs, you know some people think LEDs produce no heat. They they do. They produce a lot of heat. They just produce more light per watt than an HPS is. So to get the same amount of light, I just need to use less heat to do so. Um, so there is, a, there is generally a reduction in the amount of HVAC used, but it's not as simple as I have 20% less heat, therefore I have 20% less HVAC. It's a much more complicated um, balance. Um, you know, an HVAC system is designed to take care of the sensible heat load uh, in a room to maintain a certain temperature. And when we take away a 20% of the heat that's now in that room, we make a large shift to how the HVAC system kind of reacts. Um, Craig had also, you know, Craig had mentioned, we raised the heat, the, sorry, we raised the uh, room temperatures. So we have now less heat in the room and we're running the room a little bit warmer. What this means is that now we're running our HVAC system a little bit less. If we're running our HVAC system less, we're losing some of that dehumidification that comes from the mechanical cooling with an HVAC system, which is, and we tend to see um, one of the biggest issues is growers having uh, relative humidity problems in their rooms because their HVAC system uh, was not prepared for that kind of shift. So it generally, uh, we tend to see a lot of supplemental dehumidification uh, going into these rooms to compensate. So there is a savings to HVAC, uh, but there are some other factors that we have to consider that it's not as big as a, as a reduction as some people would hope. Um, and that's why we always kind of, you know, when you're doing these changes from HPS to LED, you have to think beyond the lighting. Think about your HVAC and bring your, you know, HVAC, wh whoever you're kind of contracted with for your HVAC systems to make sure that this change uh, is going to be able to work with your current HVAC system uh, and seeing what you might need to do to supplement to to take care of uh, to take care of these changes. Awesome, thank you for that, Brandon. Uh, so a topic that gets brought up a lot is the change in spectrum between LED and HPS. Has there been any observed effects in your research? Uh, we'll we'll pass this over to Craig. Yeah, sure. So I mentioned earlier about the the differences in direct heat coming off the fixtures uh, that can impact the leaf temperature. And, and that's, due, that's due to primarily due to the difference in spectrum. Um, but when we look and overlay these two, which this figure is showing right here, you can, you can see clearly how different the spectrum are. And this is, this is actually the, the radiation that the plants are seeing. Uh, and so the, the, the concept here that we're talking about is, is generally referred to as light quality. Uh, we can call it spectrum just to simplify things. Um, but really what, you're, what we're talking about is the spectrum that's emitted from the fixture. Uh, it's composed of many different wavelengths at different nanometers throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and really the, the range that drive plant growth the most is between 400 and 700. And so this, what you're seeing here is, is really a par, a par graph or a, a photosynthetically active radiation. Um, and one of the biggest differences that you can clearly see is that on the CT1930 side, there's, there's a huge peak in the blue part of the, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and that can or has been shown to play uh, influence plant growth in a number of different ways. One of them is, is that uh, blue light can, can cause stomata to open. Uh, so stomata are those little pores on the surface of the leaf that allow gas exchange to happen. So changing CO2 uh, and water vapor from the air and the leaf. Um, and so with blue light or more blue light uh, stimulates the, that's the model to open more, you could potentially get an increase in water loss. So that's gonna have a direct impact on uh, your irrigation management strategies uh, and humidity control. Blue light can also, or has been shown to influence plant height. 
And so there could be differences in inner node length or, or total height of the plants. Um, and, and it's also been shown, blue light's been shown to increase bud THC levels. Um, in this particular trial, we, we looked at a number of these parameters, including plant height and, and THC content. We didn't see any differences, but we, we do want to caution people um, when, you, when you do begin to grow to, to pay attention to these parameters, because depending on the cultivar that you use for your growth, um, th there's, there's known to be some differential sensitivities there. And so you could see the first time you switch some subtle differences in those, those aspects of plant growth. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. So we, we touched, touched about it briefly, but I, I wanted to dive back into the topic of power savings um, with the conversion to LED. Uh, Brandon, would you like to take that one? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, power savings is definitely a massive part of the change from HPS to LED. A lot of the times it's, it's one of the main drivers. Um, you know, we're getting the same amount of light into a room while using 20% fewer watts to do it. Um, and this savings is really what allows us to make that LED fixture be a lot more affordable uh, than when you're looking at kind of like the, the original sticky uh, sticker price. Um, you know, we're not only saving money from the power we're consuming, uh, but with a new build, uh, you know, your electrical infrastructure design based on an LED spec rather than an HPS spec, uh, HPS spec uh, can also be a large savings. You know, there's fewer breakers, a smaller transformer your reduction of your total HVAC unit sizing. Um, so there's a lot of factors that play into uh, the, you know, the savings that you'll see beyond just the amount of kilowatt hours uh, that you're going to use. Um, and, you know, I, I know the question is about power savings, but for me, power savings really just translates to, you know, how much money am I going to save? If I'm, if I'm saving power, I'm spending less money. Um, uh, and, you know, We've seen, you know, we, we work with a, a company internally called uh, Synergy. They do uh, energy rebates for, uh, for our growers to try to get the most money back from our growers and, or sorry, from the power companies for these rebates. Um, and I mean, we've seen ROIs on LED fixtures. You know, in this case, this was a, an example case from Canada where the return on investment is just over a year. And so when you start to really look at the full lifespan of a fixture, rather than the upfront cost, um, the LED fixture actually comes out cheaper for the most part when you look at it from uh, its total lifetime. That's all, all huge information, Brennan. Um, you know, if you take a look at our, our CT1930, it utilizes more like 27% fewer wattage uh, when you compare it against 1,000 watt HPS or DE fixtures. Those 1,000 watts, they round them down, right? So they, they utilize it closer to, you know, 1100 watts or 1080. Our 1700E operates closer to 40% less watts when you compare to that 1100 watt fixture. So uh, factor all that in, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with the HVAC savings, no lamp replacements every six to 12 months and the labor involved in that. It's really a no brainer uh, when you're designing a room to consider LEDs, when you're retrofitting an old, old fixtures out to consider LEDs. So those ROIs are, are, are great factors. Uh, and, and you factor in also the increase in yields, increase in the quality of the flower. Again, no brainer. <clears throat> um, you know, Brandon mentioned the rebates uh, in Canada. Same thing in the US. The US is offering on average of about 25% across the country to reduce the strain on the power grid so that these indoor cultivation sites are, are pulling from. Uh, again, we partnered with a company called Synergy based out of Seattle. They're the uh, industry leading authority on energy rebates. Uh, they help us consult. They help us simplify the process and really to maximize the potential rebates that these, uh, these fixtures have. You do have to have a fixture that is DLC listed, LED DLC listed, stands for a Design Lighting Consortium. You can go on their website and check it out. Uh, but uh, before planning any license facilities or retrofitting, we ask that you contact us or Synergy to really give you an idea of what the potential rebate. It's a quick, quick look up for us. We can really find out for you. Uh, Synergy has also been helping growers land huge, huge rebates on HVAC equipment also. So not just LEDs, but a lot of hardware for your grow room in general. Awesome, thank you guys. Uh, so, I mean, you've convinced me I want LEDs now, but uh, you know, how do I choose which ones to buy? I think that's the question now. And um, you know, whoever would like to take that 
For sure. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of LED fixtures uh, out there on the market. And, you know, like we had mentioned previously, there's a lot to overcome from an engineering perspective to make sure that you have a fixture that is going to last you a long time. Uh, I mean, Hawthorne has internally a large team of uh, R&D engineers, uh, PhDs, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers. On top of that, we have our technical services team who helps support the R&D team. We take feedback from our salespeople on the road and feed all of that information back to our categories and R&D teams to make sure that we develop a product um, that you know, meets the demands of the customer. Um, we also have a large of investments in you know, testing equipment within our uh, WH or our world headquarters uh, in Vancouver, Washington, with uh, you know, FCC isolation chamber, uh, Gonia photometer, uh, Ulbrich inter integrating sphere, uh, test ovens. We do a lot of testing internally uh, to make sure that our fixtures uh, you know, are, are, are going to stand the test of time. Uh, you know, I, I originally come from the uh, kind of commercial lighting industry, office lighting, home lighting, things like that. Um, and when I made the switch to horticulture lighting, one of the things that I really wanted to make sure people understood is that when we talk about lighting in a horticultural facility, this is not the same lighting we have at home. This is not lighting so that you can see lighting so that, you know, you feel comfortable. These are pieces of production equipment. If my light goes off at home, I'm missing a light. I can't see quite as well. If I'm losing a light in my grow, that's money directly out of my pocket. So when you invest in an LED, you really want to make sure that it's engineered to a high spec and that you have a company behind it that's going to back it up and support it. Because, um, yeah, like I said, when those fixtures go down, you want them back up and running as soon as possible. Yeah, let me add on, Brandon. Um, those are all great points. Uh, you go online and you'll go find cheap LEDs, uh, fixtures that promote themselves as thousand watt replacements. They go for about $99 up to whatever the sky's limit is. But uh, the old saying is true, especially when it comes to horticulture LEDs, you get what you pay for. So please do your research. Uh, there are many brands at all different price range. Um, oftentimes, you heard Brandon mention several times uh, that the quality of the inputs make a huge difference, right? the heat management, the quality of the diodes, the drivers themselves, not overdriving the diodes. Uh, we engineered all of our fixtures to not overdrive the diodes, but also to, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, overdriving them will achieve higher microvolts for the, the lesser quality units. But down the road, those degrade much quicker. Uh, they also lead to unwanted color shifts and premature intensity drops. So please do your research or contact us and we can walk you through it. Awesome. Well, this has been fantastic information. Is there anything else you guys would like to add before we jump into the audience Q&A? Yeah, sure, I'll dive in. I, I just wanna emphasize that every, every grow operation is different. So I mentioned before we, we saw in our particular R&D trial, the uh, increase in yield in the LED room compared to HBS room. The magnitude of that increase is gonna vary though, based on, based on numerous factors. So there, there could be cultivar differences, uh, environmental conditions. Uh, what we're seeing though, uh, as, as something that's been, been pretty interesting to come out of the, the Kelowna facility is that the concentration of the fertigation solution seems to play a pretty large role. So, you know, when we, when we fertigate plants with, with like a relatively less concentrated solution, we see a, a, a bit of a larger increase in yield difference between the two fixture types. Um, so, so really to level set expectations, uh, if you're already optimized for all your inputs and aspects of production, um, you may not see a huge increase, but um, really all of the work that's come out of the Kelowna facility so far, we've seen bud yield in the LED rooms that has, has always been as good or higher. So it's super exciting results. Yeah, and I, I just like to add that, you know, controlled environment agriculture, it's, it's a really complicated design process. One change can have a domino effect on every other factor at the, in the room. Um, and, you know, we at Hawthorne, we really have a great depth of experience in this space. Um, you know, we have experience from the, uh, you know, traditional growers, we have experience from horticulturalists, from engineers, from really every aspect. Uh, and we're really here to help support growers to make sure that when we're making a change, we're really considering every factor um, and, and really are just there to, to support them in uh, every step of the way. 
has pretty much covered it all. So uh, I'll, I'll just close with this. Please feel free to reach out to our sales team. Uh, Brandon mentioned the tech services offering uh, and or Synergy, right? All together. Um, the Hawthorne, Gavita, Sun System, and Synergy websites are also a great place to get started. Um, we appreciate everybody's time and thanks for stopping by. Yes, thank you guys. So uh, we're going to be switching into the uh, audience Q&A portion at this point. Uh, I see we already have one question in here. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to use that Q&A box at the bottom and our panel here will be answering those questions live. So uh, I'll go ahead and I'll read out the first question and then whoever wants to take that one can go ahead and jump in. So how will switching to LED affect my feedings? Yeah, so this is a, this is a tricky one. Um, I, I just kind of mentioned some of the, the observations that we've seen out of the Kelowna facility. Um, but I think to piggyback off uh, something earlier that Brandon said, this is going to really be tied to uh, transpiration uh, and the, any adjustments that need to be made um, based, on, based on just more or less um, water needs for, uh, for, for the plant. And so... Um, I don't know, Brandon, if, if, if you want to reiterate some of the, the points that you made earlier, but, but I think it's, it's, uh, it will be possible to adjust just slightly. We don't have any questions come in yet. Oh, I lied. So this question is from Chris Davey. So when conducting the LED trials, did you guys use different types of light in terms of like different wattages or different? Yeah, so for the, the trials that we discussed earlier that I, that I referred to uh, at the beginning of the presentation, we really were just testing uh, the, the research question was about HPS versus LED, and we used uh, our signature Gavita products for that. So those, the double-ended 1,000-watt HPS uh, versus the Gavita CT1930E top light. Uh, so we do have another question here from Brandon. Uh, so which trial cultivars did you run under the LEDs? What was the average THC, uh, you know, LED versus, versus HPS? So the cultivar that was used was um, Black Cherry Punch 2. Uh, we, we, do have a, we do have a population on site. We originally got, got that source from uh, a supplier up in Canada. And um, as for um, our, all of our yields were, it were between, you know, 50 and 75 grams per plant and THC levels for that cultivar can run between, I think, 18 and 23 percent. And we were we were right around 17 or 18 percent in this in this particular trial. So we're we're um, pretty pleased with the performance of the plants under both conditions and and really the main difference that we saw in, in, in our testing was, was with, the, with the bud yield. Awesome. Let's see. So we have another question here. So are, are there more options to play with the spectrum presets that wouldn't be possible to get with an HPS? Yeah, I mean, that's actually one area that we're really aggressively researching on the R&D side. And so, um, a lot of the work that we're doing now in the Kelowna facility is to, is to optimize, not, not really optimize, but to customize the spectrum in ways that, that are unique and, and novel with the end goal of, of manipulating or having some desired effect on, on plant growth and development. So I, I, I can't share too much about those specifics of those because they're still, they're still underway, but um, there, sh there should be some pretty interesting and exciting things that can be done by being able to customize and deliver uh, a more prescriptive spectrum as the plants are growing. Yeah. And just to add on to that, just to add on to that, you know, there, there are fixtures in the market that are all, you know, tunable spectrum and you can do a million different things. And I, I think, you know, with us, we, we really want to make sure that if we are going to do that, we need to make sure that it's worth it. Right, because there can be, if you have a million different possibilities to run with a light, it's you know one more factor that is can cause an issue within your grow. So before anything you know is is released into the market that that we feel is is worth it, there's going to be extensive research done on it uh, to to make sure that it's 
it's worth the additional, um, you know, uh, additional change um, to, to make sure that it's it's worthwhile. All right. Well, it looks like we're we're out of questions at this time, but you know, I just want to thank Craig, Brandon, Hi, for taking the time to put forth this presentation today and answer some questions for us all and provide this fantastic information regarding LEDs. And uh, you know, uh, we also just want to thank Hawthorne for sponsoring today's webinar and. Um, you know, that wraps it up. Uh, do you guys want to give any final shout outs? Uh, great job, guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks. thanks for all the attention. <laughs> and uh, thank you for, uh, for moderating. Appreciate it. Uh, of course. Yeah. It was a great time. Thanks, yeah, it was my pleasure. Go, right, go team photons. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> go team photons. All right. That wraps it up, everybody. Thank you to those who attended. And uh, again, thanks to our presenters. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they look forward to your questions uh, after this.